Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Alazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com and today we'll talk about the November update 2022. So on the agenda today we'll start with the implementing rolling plan of October 2022. So it was published by the EU Commission and what we can see is that um, the information about Annex 16 uh, that uh, we had the positive opinion uh, from uh, from the Commission on October 13, 2022, um, which means that mainly the common specification that was um, drafted was uh, uh, approved, if I can say. Um, the only thing is that there was a vote, there was a positive opinion, um, but I'm not really sure actually of what is the next step because uh, we still have the question about the transition period, uh, which is actually six months after the implementation of the com uh, common specification. But uh, with the overload of notified bodies, with uh, all that, so I'm not sure that this is a, a feasible uh, transition period. And we are waiting for that now to just see if they will still maintain this. So if you are an Annex uh, 16 company, which is a, pro a company that is manufacturing products that have no medical purpose, uh, like uh, contact lenses that are not here to view but to maybe color your eyes or have maybe some more cosmetic things uh, some other products like C lipolysis liposuction lipoplasty uh, or uh, implants that are inserted on the body but are not considered as a uh, implant for uh, structure i mean not meeting the definition of medical device all this has to be um, to be uh, reviewed and you have to understand that be, soon you will have to follow the EUMDR. Uh, so it's why mainly it's really important that we understand those timelines for you also to, to work on that. I am working with some companies that are under this uh, scope and the problem is that when we are trying to discuss with notified bodies, they say, no, we don't talk with you or we don't want to hear from you until the common specifications are published. Uh, so this is mainly the, the thing that uh, that is uh, actually blocking uh, also the discussion with notified bodies and, and, and working with them. Um, so um, as soon as those common specifications are published, we have to understand what is the timeline, what um, when it will be mandatory to then place those devices on the market under MDR. Uh, so this is mainly the, the, the question mark, that the big question mark that we have here. So let's see that and let's uh, look more for what uh, the commission will say to us. And talking about uh, uh, cosmetic devices, so I will be talking also at the ACRAS, A-C-R-A-S.me uh, uh, conference where we'll talk more about aesthetic products. And I will try to um, explain more about the, this, uh, also the reclassification of some medical devices uh, under Annex 16 uh, and explain also the state of the art, the, state, the actual state of this, uh, of this uh, regulation or, uh, for MDR for cosmetic products. So if you are part of the ACRAS, event so uh, you will hear me there speaking about that okay there was in october 24th an mdcg uh, meeting and we have the, the mdcg agenda so mainly the agenda will be talking about this transition for mdr and ivdr we have more and more um, uh, trade association or association that are uh, talking to the eu commission and saying to them that yes this transition period is not sustainable uh, by manufacturers because Mainly, there are uh, a lot of issues to appoint a notified body and then to get uh, to the point uh, of uh, being on the market under MDR. And uh, as a reminder, the EU MDR uh, transition period uh, finish on the 26th of May 2024. So it means that uh, from this date, you will not be able to anymore to use the Article 120, which is the article for the transition period. And you will have to have an EU MDR certificate to place your device on the market. And we have a big risk uh, from what the trade association or the manufacturer are saying, and also what many are, are, are discussed now with the MDCG in this MDCG agenda of um, uh, products that will not be able anymore to be available on the market. And this is what the MDCG is trying to avoid. So we are not think, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to understand that they are also understanding that and they put that on the agenda and they are trying to avoid that. But this is mainly some alerts that we are receiving from, uh, from some uh, association. Also some uh, countries that are mentioning that and telling that maybe uh, we have to rediscuss this transition period. So don't know what, will, what is the outcome. 
of this uh, MDCG agenda, uh, guy, uh, MDCG meeting. But this question of uh, transition uh, of the UMDR uh, is on the table. We don't know if this will be discussed, like we will extend the transition period or if this will be discussed in terms of finding more solution to avoid uh, any problem on the market before the 26th of May, 2024. So, uh, regarding the, um, the EU Commission, so we have uh, a new uh, update of the uh, page for contacting DG Santé. So if you want to contact maybe some people at DG Santé, so then uh, I put the, this link on the show notes where you can uh, then get uh, more information about uh, who to contact, uh, which uh, person uh, is there, etc. Et so this is just an update of the page with more information. So Team NB has issued a position paper on off-label use. So the question mainly, and it's the question that uh, the, uh, the Team NB, so which is Team Notified Body, so an association of notified bodies, uh, are saying is that there is no kind of an official rule under MDR of what is off-label use, but they are trying to explain that uh, within the uh, within the uh, this position paper. Uh, what maybe what mainly they are saying is that. Um, the objective is um, to answer this question of off-label use is because on the MDR they are saying that during a PMCF you have to collect also information about off-label use. So what does it mean exactly? What are you uh, willing to collect here? So here they are trying to make you understand that an off-label use is kind of considered like a misuse or foreseeable misuse so that uh, the, the manufacturer is doing not something that they are voluntarily uh, doing uh, otherwise yeah here it's more like uh, they are not following the, the, the regulation and you cannot really uh, use those data but it's more about misuse and how you can maybe reduce the risk by updating uh, those uh, those information here um, so you can also understand that for example if some people are doing some off-label use of your device because there is no other solution for a certain type of disease or certain type of condition of uh, of, of the patients. Um, this off lapel use it can of is normal if I can say because um, it's normal that yeah when we don't have a clear solution that we are providing uh, we are trying to use what is already existing on the market and trying to uh, to update that. Uh, what is also said is that uh, if there is some off lapel use that are only done once. Uh, it's fine, but if it is repeated, then uh, this is really something that uh, should be uh, uh, considered and understood. And there was also the answer about the question related to uh, what if uh, you are trying to use the PMCF uh, data like that, so to collect data about off-label use. Uh, to then say that your products maybe can now follow those new indications because uh, it was tested by many people, etc. Uh, here it says many that all the literatures or elements that are uh, gathered from off-label use uh, should not be considered as a high quality information uh, because mainly they are not following the indication of the manufacturer and everything. So um, you can include that because you have also to include the information that uh, that uh, are uh, accepted or not accepted, if I can say, on the, on the study. But uh, you should not consider that as high quality data, maybe high quantity, but not high quality. So if you have some question about off-label use, you can really read this position paper that is really complete and trying really to make you understand uh, what means off-label use and how you have to consider that. But inside off-label use, there are some inclusion or also exclusion of what uh, the products that should be considered off-label or not off-label. So this is also something that is uh, important. So Team NB has also uh, issued an, a position paper on cyber security. So cyber security is also uh, an important topic uh, to be discussed for some software medical devices. Um, as I said, Team NB is team notified body. So what they are saying on this position paper is mainly some elements that notified bodies will follow. So they are suggesting you some methodology, some protocols on how to do a cyber security. They are also uh, mentioning some specific standards. So for example, the standard IEC 81001-5-1, which is the health software security, and also the IEC TR 6601-4-5, which is a safety-related technical security specification. Uh, and they are also mentioning you that you have to um, check what is 
what are the known threats for your type of software, what are those elements. So you have to gather some information on uh, what are the possible threats that are already existing on your field. You have also to not exclude the, the use of the ISO 14971, which is about risk management. You have to identify the risks and if there is a cybersecurity threat, then you have to find a solution to uh, reduce or remove this, uh, this threat. So this is mainly what, um, uh, what is uh, mentioned on this position paper. So if you have to follow certain rules, so I think this position paper can really help you to identify what is great. We had also an MDCG guidance about cybersecurity for EU MDR. Uh, so combine that also with this document to then have a complete solution uh, in terms of guidance. So it doesn't give you the full detail of what exactly you have to do, but it guides you on which document or which references you have to look at. Okay, today this episode is uh, sponsored by MedBoard. So MedBoard is the website that is providing you uh, a lot of information about medical device uh, companies, medical device devices, literatures, everything. So uh, if you need to make a regulatory update, if you need to search for information about medical devices, MedBoard is the website to go. Uh, so I'm using that also for uh, this episode to gather a lot of uh, the links or a lot of the elements that are changed in the world. So I don't need uh, to uh, look at each website one by one, I go to MedBoard, I make my research and I find all the information directly. So uh, don't hesitate to go to medboard.com to uh, see how uh, this uh, website or this portal can help you. Uh, but mainly this is the one I'm using for all my uh, the information I'm trying to gather about medical devices. So we have a new notified body under UMDR, which is ECM Italy. And uh, so it is the uh, uh, 34th notified body under UMDR and we have uh, still seven notified body under IVDR. Uh, there, so there are, we are still waiting for more. There are more applications, but yeah, the process from application to arrive to the end, if I can say is a, a bit long. Everybody's complaining on that, so it's not like uh, no, nobody knows. But yeah, mainly uh, we have 34 notified bodies under MDR, seven under IVDR, which is still not uh, enough here. And at the same moment, uh, the uh, commission is also issuing uh, a notified body survey on the application that they are receiving, uh, which is also something that is really uh, interesting to read. Uh, I made some, some slides for you just so that you can see that. So um, there, what we can see is that um, we have uh, the date of expiration of those uh, certificates under MDD and AIMDD and there are really a lot that will happen in, in 2024. What we see also is the number of applications. So how much, um, how many applications do we have and how many certificates are issued every, every month. And we can see that, for example, in October, we had 8,120 applications and only uh, 1,990 certificates were issued. Um, but we see that in, for each month, so it's really something that uh, is critical. So it means that uh, mainly uh, we have more applications than uh, certificates that are issued, which means also that uh, when we will arrive to this transition period, at the end of the transition period in 2024, um, there will be a lot more applications, but not too much certificates that are issued. So there, this is also the point where we say that uh, there will be a gap between the end of the transition period, 26th of May 2024, and the issuance of some certificates that will maybe happen uh, a bit later. Uh, so be ready for this kind of thing. Be ready for, um, be for, for, for if I can say, having some stock, if I can sell the market. So place your devices on the market uh, if, if you, you may have this gap between the date of uh, uh, the end of the transition period and the date when you will receive your, your certificate. We have also a discussion about uh, the refused applications. So here there are also the reason for some applications that were refused. Um, we have some, for example, uh, mention of insufficient notified body designation. But here apparently it's one notified body that has uh, has uh, no resource available. So many, it's why he, say, he mentioned that. So only one notified body says that. Uh, and then wrong conformity assessment that were chosen or wrong qualification of a product or classification of devices or application was not complete. So um, you have to understand also that when you are making an application, there can be some uh, applications that are refused. So you have to make it good from the beginning. Otherwise, yeah, you will also lose some time then to have that there. For IVD, so we have the same situation. For IVD, uh, more application arrives and not too much 
application or see email that are issued but now we are at the beginning of the IVD uh, transition period so it's why maybe we start only to have that now but um, yeah with seven notified bodies we can understand that it's not sufficient to manage uh, all the applications that are reserved and it would be the same story end of 2024 uh, there will be this transition but now there is some extension also due to uh, if your product is already on the market under IVD um, but if your product is not on the market under IVD now um, so you enter directly into, inside this transition period uh, that uh, that uh, that are mentioned on the on the EU IVDR. So be careful of all that. Those dates are really important for your business. Otherwise, you can maybe uh, lose some market or stop uh, some products on the market. And it's what the Commission or the MDCG tries to avoid. But um, as you are your own uh, <laughs> manager of your destiny, if I can say, uh, don't uh, don't yeah don't don't uh, wait for solution coming from external, try it by yourself to uh, place your device on the market and to get the certificate as soon as possible uh, so that you are really solving this issue. Don't wait, I mean, the idea is that just don't wait, try to, uh, to be proactive on that. Okay, in the UK, what's happening? So we had initially the information that uh, the UKCA, the new UK regulation will be uh, mandatory from the the thirty uh, the first July first of July twenty twenty three, but they extended now uh, the the date uh, to first of July twenty twenty four. So twelve months extension. It means that you can still continue to have your devices on the market uh, as a CE mark product in the UK until the first of July twenty twenty four, and after that, normally the UK will have issued its future regulation. Uh, and then you will have to follow this regulation to place your devices on the market. There is still the question about uh, for products that are already on the market, will there be a transition period? What they mentioned on the consultation uh, response is that yes, there will be a three to five years, I suppose three years for uh, medical devices and five years maybe for uh, in vitro diagnostic. It looks the same as what the MDR has done, but nothing was kind of officially mentioned for the moment. Uh, so we are expecting also this clarification about products that are already under the market as a CE marked or UKCA, will there be the transition period for that? So let's wait for that. So last month we talked also about that the MHRA has updated its vigilance system. So the more database uh, has been updated. So if you want to access to the previous database, you have until the November 21st, if I remember. Um, and now you have to re-register a new account under the new database uh, since now, I mean, since uh, mid of October. Um, so the page that I showed you last month has been a bit updated and I show that to you now. They have added some webinars where they are, can explain to you more about uh, how to uh, create the account or how to do all those elements uh, related to the more database. So now if you want to still look at the previous uh, data, you can still go there and maybe archive them or download them to archive them. But any new vigilance should be done with this new vigilance reporting system. So you have really to um, to open uh, that as soon as possible so that uh, it can it can be working. I mean, you can still have access to the previous one. It's just that uh, as we have the new one, you have really to uh, uh, to uh, to work on this one there. So look at the show notes and you'll find the link where you can find the page with all the webinars uh, that they have created so that they can help you. Okay, in Switzerland, so as I said, we have the EU, we have UK now, Switzerland. So in Switzerland, we had the conference, uh, Met Swiss MedTech conference on October 19th, 2022. And um, at, during the conference, so we had a, a publication from Swiss MedTech that was uh, kind of uh, proposing. Swiss MedTech is not Swiss Medic. So Swiss MedTech is an association in Switzerland for, for the MedTech companies. So they are proposing uh, to Switzerland to uh, accept also FDA registered devices, uh, which means that uh, not only EU CE marked devices uh, will be accepted in Switzerland, but also FDA. As said, it's a proposal. It's not like something that was really uh, voted and implemented. Um, but for them, it makes sense because UMDR start to be a little bit complicated, not really, uh, and with all the situation that we talk about, the transition period, the lack of notified bodies, etc., it creates a lot of issues for a lot of manufacturers. So they say if they want to reserve some innovative products, they should maybe accept FDA uh, registered products. Why? Because 
There is also the information that a lot of manufacturers, as they find EU MDR too much complicated, they are focusing on the US. So they try to register their products on the US uh, so that um, they can sell their products or their innovative products. The problem here, for example, is that if you are a startup, and if you are trying to um, place a new innovative device on the market, uh, you have to find a notified body. And the problem is that uh, notified bodies are focused now on their own uh, customers, priority number one to their customers, because it's normal. Uh, and then they are um, putting on a waiting list all the others if they have no capacity, uh, which means that even if you, I mean, if you are an innovative product, uh, maybe you will have to wait many years before your products can be reaching the market. And it's why in the meantime, they say, okay, let's go to the US for the moment because it's easier maybe to go there and to register our device there. And it's why Switzerland now says, okay, let's accept products also coming from the US so that we can also benefit from innovative products. The idea is to try to benefit for their patients, but yeah, mainly uh, this is the, their idea. I mean, the idea of Swiss MedTech. It's not something that um, is new. We have a lot of other countries that are doing that, that are accepting EU registered products or FDA registered products, uh, but here, and the point is that maybe some manufacturers that cannot register in Europe will go to the US to be able then to enter to Switzerland. So this is also the, the discussion of um, if the product is EU accepted and FDA accepted, which one is uh, is uh, is uh, has the priority or which one should be registered then. So this is mainly uh, under discussion. So it's just a proposal. So don't go and say to everybody, yes, they, ha they will accept this or that. No, they I mean, this is a proposal. I put also on the... Uh, show notes the link to the Swiss MedTech uh, information about that where they are explaining also uh, the, the reason for all this. Uh, so I hope this will not be a fight between now, if I can say, multiple countries to say, oh, uh, UMDI is wrong, so go to FDA, or FDA is wrong, let's go to Europe. I mean, there was a lot of this ping pong, if I can say, existing between the US and Europe. Uh, before it was US that was more attractive, then it was Europe, then it was US, so it's uh, like a ping pong that is happening. So uh, let's see what will be coming, but yeah, Switzerland is making some move on this direction now. Okay, so this week we have the Team PRC annual meeting, which will happen in November 3rd and 4th, 2022. Uh, so if you are a PRC, if you are really willing to understand more about the PRC role, if you have a question about PRC, as we've seen on one of our podcasts, uh, can a PRC go to jail? So the idea here is to help you and answer all your questions and maybe be more confident being PRC. Uh, there will be a lot of PRC within this um, Brussels meeting. So if you can still attend, it's in uh, two, three days. Uh, I will be there. I will be uh, joining. So I will be participating to um, to the, the event. If you want to meet also, don't hesitate. Send me just a, a small message and we can maybe uh, meet uh, to uh, to discuss about um, whatever you want to discuss. But uh, yeah, Team PRC is organizing that for the first year in Brussels. Uh, but I'm sure it will be a great event because we have also um, uh, NDCG members that will be there. Uh, we have Team NB members that will be there. We have also Eric Volbrecht, our preferred lawyer, that will be there. So, yeah, I mean, this will be an event where we will have a lot of discussion with a, a lot of a lot of people. So um, if you are coming, so go to the show notes and uh, see also the event, the agenda, the, the timing, etc. And uh, let's meet and have a, a good event there. Okay, what is happening in the rest of the world? So we are talking now about the US. So US, as usual, they have this newsletter that is called Medicine 2022. Uh, so I will not summarize what is on this letter, but um, to be honest, it's really a letter that is containing a lot of information. It contains a list of recalls. It contains the guidance documents that are issued, the safety communications, the letter that are done to healthcare prov providers, FDA meetings also and conferences and all highlight reports. So um, I have put the link also on the show notes, so I don't hesitate to go. Uh, this is a document that will really help you to understand what is happening now in the US uh, market. In Malaysia, we have a training that is planned on uh, good uh, distribution practices uh, for the lead auditors. So this is a, a training that uh, is organized in Malaysia So by the authorities. So uh, you can also check uh, on the show notes, I have placed the, the link to there. So if you are from Malaysia and you are a lead auditor, then maybe you can benefit from this training. All the information are on the, on the communication there. 
And China is issuing a page for medical device recalls. Uh, so it's in English. So just to highlight, because each time it was in, in, in Chinese and I had to make some translation, now it's in English. So uh, it's really a great document because it's showing exactly how they are managing for recalls, which can be a great uh, document for you to also update your procedures and understand exactly how uh, you have to manage recalls for Chinese, uh, the Chinese market. So if you have a recall on the Chinese market, it's explaining to you everything on how you are you will have to follow that. So take this page, uh, bookmark it uh, uh, if possible, so that maybe you are looking at that later. But the idea here is that um, this is the law and the rules on how to uh, manage recourse for the Chinese market. Okay, let's talk about trainings. So we have this month, the Green Belt Certification Training. So we had also that last uh, last week. I mean, last week we had finished the October October one. Uh, this month we have it uh, between November 21st and November 25th. Uh, so as usual, so the Green Belt Certification Training is for EUMDR. We are training uh, everybody on uh, all the aspects of EUMDR. So from the general overview of uh, the transition period, significant changes to economic operators, to the classification, to the notified body situation, uh, to the technical documentation, how to build the technical documentation. And we are presenting to you some examples, uh, clinical evaluation report, PMCF, PMS, UDAMED. We are visiting UDAMED with you and showing to you all the secrets of UDAMED. Uh, also UDI, we are also telling you uh, uh, how to uh, use the UDI code and create the UDI code. So, I mean, it's really a complete uh, training where we go from A to Z. Um, we have also at the end the certification uh, exam where we are uh, helping, I mean, verifying that you are understanding everything and uh, then you can get your diploma uh, out of that. So don't hesitate to register on the link on the show notes uh, to uh, then uh, get uh, the session. We have the session of November, but we have also planned the session in December. So don't hesitate also to look at uh, the session in December uh, if you are not able to attend the one in November. And I will try to uh, issue the new sessions for January, February and March. We have also a UDAMED training that is issued by uh, Richard Julian, so the company Hire uh, Med. Uh, so it will be November 30th. So uh, this training is mainly to help you understand all the aspects of uh, UDAMED. So UDAMED is also, uh, I mean, this is mainly to register elements in UDAMED, to understand how to uh, open all the UDAMED uh, accounts, etc. all those things. So they, they are telling you, I mean, Richard is telling you everything. So don't hesitate also to go to the show notes to link uh, on the UDAMED, uh, UDAMED training. If you are a PRC this time, uh, Ronald Boomans uh, from Ronald Boomans Consulting has also issued a PRC training. Uh, so you can have also uh, the link on the show notes. So this is really important to understand uh, that uh, you cannot just be a PRC just by, if I can say, following just the regulation. You have also to understand uh, what is being a PRC, what are the liabilities uh, behind that, what are the risks uh, and what are the activities that you have to perform. So Ronald Boomans will really show uh, to you all this. He will also provide you some case studies. He has provided some case studies already on LinkedIn so that you can look at that. But uh, yeah, it's really a training that uh, I would really recommend you to attend if you are willing to become a, a PRC or if you are a PRC and need a training, uh, training for that. And last, we have a book. So Eric Volbrecht um, has issued his Enriched MDR and IVDR second edition book. Uh, so you can uh, go on the show notes also to uh, look at that. I, I'm not sure if it is available now, but he has also issued that in a uh, different format. And this time we have the EPUB format, uh, which is the format for tablets also uh, that you can uh, you can uh, you can get. Uh, so. This is mainly a document that is a book that is really providing all possible information on MDR and IVDR. A lot of information from Eric, a lot of guidances, a lot of ideas, a lot of things. So it is a second edition that is issued now and I'm really recommending to, uh, to buy this kind of document for you and for uh, learning, having a better learning on EUMDR and IVDR. Okay, now the podcast. So... We have just two podcasts because, yeah, as we had the episode 200, so we had to shift a bit all the, the other podcasts. So uh, the podcast uh, of uh, this month is the podcast of episode 202, which is how to be MDSAP certified. So I'm explaining to you MDSAP, how to get certified, how to uh, teach your team also about MDSAP. I mean, it's really uh, uh, if you really are trying to get to MDSAP. So this is mainly the learning that I'm trying to provide to you. 
Then we have episode 203. We have uh, Can you go to jail if you are a PRC with LM Ein, which is the president of Team PRC. So this is mainly uh, a great episode for you as, as I've said to un that helps you to answer some of your question because this is only one of the questions that we are trying to answer there. We talked also about do we need an insurance? Do we need, um, uh, I mean, uh, who is responsible in case there is an issue, etc., on the market? So LM Ein is uh, president of Team PRC and they are receiving a lot of those questions. So this is mainly what we are trying to, uh, to provide here on this episode to give you some answers and also to encourage you to come to this Team PRC annual event uh, so that you are also um, meeting people that can answer also to your, your questions. Okay, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. So don't hesitate to send me an email at info at easymedicaldevice.com I-N-F-O at easymedicaldevice.com If you have any question, if you have any suggestion, I'm receiving sometimes some suggestion about uh, some podcast episodes and I'm then looking at who can help for that. So don't hesitate to send me some suggestion or if you want to participate to the podcast, don't hesitate also just uh, send me an email and we can see if we can make a, an episode together. So thank you again. Thank you for your support. Thank you for all your messages and I wish you a nice day. <laughs>